This is the Married to Doctors podcast, episode number 120. I have walked out of a horrible code where the patient, you know, died despite all of the aggressive efforts. And I got to go smile and talk to the next patient and tell them that we're going to do an operation and everything's going to go smoothly and they're going to go home and, and everything's going to be fine. Welcome to the Married to Doctors podcast. Because we know that being married to a doctor isn't always as glamorous as it sounds, our podcast helps successful homes be happier. We're here to build community, hear your stories, and explore solutions with the experts. Here's your host, Laura McKeldry. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Married to Doctors podcast. I hope everyone had a wonderful December celebrating the holidays. Hope you all got a little bit of time off and time with your families. I'm really excited for some new episodes this year. And I thought, what a better way to start out than with having my husband back on the show. It's been quite a while since you were here. So welcome back to the podcast, Josh. Thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah, I think the first interview you did got a lot of positive feedback, and I had some more questions for you. Well, I am one of your biggest fans, and I am flattered that you would invite me to be on your show. It had nothing to do with the holiday crunch, nothing at all, (laughs) I promise. (laughs) So anyway, I did want to talk about an important topic today. Several episodes ago, I think it was episode 115, I interviewed someone about death and dying. And the purpose of that interview was really to find out, you know, what we as spouses could do to help our physicians when someone dies. And I think she did give a lot of good advice. One of the important things she said was that if we are more comfortable with death ourselves, or in other words, if we have like our stuff together, like our wills and our kind of our last wishes and our burial plans and all of that stuff, that we're going to be a lot more comfortable with death. So I wanted to start out just by asking you, well, first of all, for the listeners that don't know you, why don't you talk a little bit about your specialty and your training and then how you spend your time in the hospital? I am a surgeon. I did a general surgery residency and I also did a surgical critical care residency. I do trauma and emergency general surgery um, at a hospital, Cox South in Southern Missouri. And uh, me and my partners have a, an acute care surgery practice. So basically all of our businesses, whatever comes in through the emergency department, the trauma and also any patients that have surgical issues that are acutely ill. Common things are acute appendicitis and gallbladder issues, and other things are bowel obstructions, perforation, and and people that are sick and bleeding or whatever the issues may be. It's it's a variety of things, but uh, that's kind of my day in, day out work. Uh, I do the critical care aspect of of surgery, so I'm in our uh, surgical ICU and caring for people that are sick and injured enough to require uh, support for multi-organ system failure. And would you say, like, on a kind of a scale of physicians, do you think, just based on the work that you do, that you might see more death and dying than other physicians, maybe not as much as others? Like, where do you feel like you fall on that scale? I deal with death and dying frequently. Uh, Even today at work, there were uh, a few patients that we had to deal with those issues. So, so this is a regular aspect of critical care and critical care is dealing with people who are actively dying and trying to reverse that process. And often it's not possible um, or it's inconsistent with the patient's wishes. And so, so we deal with death and dying frequently in the critical care world. My previous guest had said that she feels that people are more comfortable with death and dying when they have like I mentioned earlier, kind of their quote unquote stuff together, like they're kind of ready for it. Like they've maybe planned their funeral or they discussed where they want to be buried, things like that. In your experience in dealing with families and those on the verge of death, I guess, would you say that you've seen any patterns for those that are maybe more prepared or more at peace for dying? 
I think the the easy answer is, yeah, when it's a when it's an easy death, you know, then then people are more comfortable with it. You know, when it's you know great great grandma who um, all of you know her you know children have passed on and she's you know demented in a nursing home, then we see death as the next step and and okay. When it's a young person, then the death you know robs them of you know, their young family and, and all of that, that potential, then death is, is very hard to deal with. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I, I've seen a variety of those things. E- even just earlier this week, I had a young man pass away and it was, it was, it was heart wrenching for um, the family. And it was, you know, emotionally difficult for, you know, the people who, who helped care for him. It was hard to see. Mm-hmm. And you think that's mo- mostly because of his age? Yeah, I, I, I think we are normally comfortable with you know, older people who have lived a full life who, you know, we, we, we say things like it's their time and this is okay. And it's kind of hard to apply those things to a young person. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. That seems kind of self-evident, but but definitely um, makes sense, I guess, to me. Regarding people kind of having their plans together, I'm curious if you see people that have their plans together, but then... Now, is this the healthcare providers or the family members of the person who's dying? I'm talking about the family members themselves. So let's say the family members come in, they've got their living wills filled out, they're like... You know, basically they have a folder that has all their stuff in it. Like, this is what I want to have happen to me. And this is what I don't want to have happen to me. But I'm curious if you, first of all, do you see people that are really that prepared or is that unusual? And also, do you see a lot of times where, well, yeah, that's what we thought we wanted. But now that, now that it's really going down, we're changing our plans. People frequently uh, proactively put together a living will. They designate their durable power of attorney. And almost everybody says, if there's no reasonable recovery, I don't want to be in a vegetative state. And just let me die at that point. I think everyone, the, the vast majority of people that I've come across have a living will that, that says that. But when do you put that together? When you're healthy and doing all right, and you say, this is how, you know, if I die, I don't want it to be drawn out. But inevitably, they're functioning and being healthy, and then something happens, and then you have to deal with, well, is this the event? Is this the time where where we say we're not going to go through all these aggressive uh, interventions? And so it's it's not always straightforward, because there's a lot of things that, you know, we can get you through this. You know, will it mean that you'll have a prolonged hospitalization, that we'll have to do some aggressive medical care, and that you may have, you know, a protracted recovery in some sort of skilled nursing facility or something? And the answer is yes. Um, sometimes people do often proceed to go through that, but... Uh, uh, I can think of a few instances where people have said, no, 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 no. I've lived a good life. If this is what takes me out, so be it. And I'd say, you know, that's the minority of people that proactively say, no, 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 no. If this is how I die, let me die. Mm-hmm. I remember one time you mentioned something to me. I don't remember what you called it. It was like the Aunt Sally effect or something like that, which is kind of where everybody's on board. You guys have kind of made a plan. You've had good conversations with the family. And then aunt Sally shows up and is like, wait, we can't let him die. I don't know if, if, if it has a, I can't think of any, you know, name for, for that phenomenon, but it does happen. You know, it's, it's, it's common for not everyone to be, you know, unified. Um, it's, it's convenient when, when everyone is unified, but uh, it's, it's not uncommon for, for uh, a family member or even sometimes, you know, a close friend that maybe isn't ready to, to concede that. 
And, and one way that, that that is managed is we don't get in the middle of that conversation. All right. Uh, when we are counseling with the, the family of our, our patient, um, often the patient is mentally incapacitated and can't participate in those conversations. They're critically ill. Um, they have breathing tubes in They're uh, they're sedated or they're, so sick that, you know, they're, you know, incoherent. And so we have to have these conversations with the next of kin. And so often we'll sit down with the next of kin and, and discuss the details and make decisions with them. And if there's any issues with, with family members, we're happy to share information with them and, uh, and, you know, give them that, that appropriate attention. But ultimately the conversation is between, as the healthcare providers and the next of kin. Mm -hmm. So you don't want like 40 people in the room, right? You try to get just one or two. I'm happy to accommodate families, but sometimes when, you know, we all have families and, and sometimes there's friction between family members, there's divisions and, and trying to, trying to referee that is, is not our place as healthcare providers. And so if there's, if there's issues, then those are issues that need to be dealt with at the family level. But when it comes to goals of care discussions, if there is that friction, then we, we separate people out and we have that with those who um, have the responsibility to have that conversation, who's whoever the next of kin is, the spouse, the adult children, or you know, whoever may be you know, down the chain of next of kin. Mm -hmm. So this has been good. I think this is some important information, but what I'd like to do now is really transition to not so much from the patient perspective, but I really wanted to pivot to the physician and the physician family perspective, because of course this podcast is about physician families. And so I wanted to just start with kind of a personal question, I guess, but that is, and you didn't know this one was coming, so you can tell me to skip it if we need to, but do you remember losing your first patient? And what do you think made that patient feel like, quote unquote, yours, if you will? And what was that experience like? Um, I... I don't know if I have a first experience where I can say, you know, that was the first time I, I had a patient that I was responsible for and they passed away. You know, death is inherently common in healthcare. You know, people show up in various stages of, of dying and we try and, you know, reverse that. And sometimes you can't. And, and uh, I, I think the majority of deaths are those that are already far gone and we're not able to save them. But, uh, I do remember one patient um, in particular because I was I was a, a junior resident in a residency and and we were in the ICU and the patient was not doing very well and the ICU nurses were looking to me for direction and I did the best that I could and the patient ultimately uh, passed away. I remember being you know frustrated. And not knowing, you know, did I do the right thing? Is this something that uh, I could have, I could have fixed. I could have saved this one and I failed. Um, that was very frustrating. That was very frustrating. And then I had to discuss the patient at our weekly morbidity and mortality conference. And I, I think after I presented the patient and, you know, there's always a lot of questions that, that probe uh, into the details of the case and my understanding of the pathophysiology and my thoughts on it. I think what helped me was one of my colleagues or one of the attendings said, based on the, the autopsy report, it sounds like there wasn't much I could do. So that's one of my patients. Mm -hmm. And, and I still wonder if there's something I could do, but it was comforting to have someone I looked up to say, this one likely was not salvageable. I don't actually know how much death and dying you see because I don't know that you necessarily share it with me. Occasionally you do. I mean, you have, but I, I don't know if you, how can I word this? How often do you see people die 
And what percentage of those deaths do you think you share with me? Uh, I don't know. This week I've seen three people pass away and I don't think I shared any of them with you. Well, it is Christmas time. (laughs) Yeah. When do you think you're more likely to share them with me? When I'm struggling with it. Okay. You are naturally one of my support team. And, uh, and I think, yeah, I don't go into the details with you just because number one, you know, the details are in a different language, you know, in the medical world, we learn to, you know, speak in a way that communicates information to another medical professional. And if I were to speak to you in that way, you might nod and, you know, shake your head. Yes, but I don't think you would understand all of it, but I try to share this was difficult. This was frustrating. I'm, yeah, I might share that, you know, I am frustrated with how things went with how um, the team worked together or something, but, uh, but I won't share, you know, too many of the medical details with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like you don't really share very much. I'm wondering if, is that like, because you're just really good at dealing with death and it's part of your job and you've learned how to deal with it and process it? Or is it more of like a protection to not like put that burden on your wife and kids? What do you think? I I think to some degree, uh, I don't know, you kind of beat down in training to, you know, kind of be, I guess a kind way to put it is matter of fact and objective about things. And it may be callous to, to feel that, you know, okay, yeah, people die, you know, we should just kind of deal with it and we do what we can. And when that's it, you move on. Um, I think it'd be nice if things work that way, but I think our humanity demands that we look at, at everyone and, and put a little more value in them than just objectively, can save them versus can't save them. Uh, I had a conversation with one of the charge nurses in the ICU and we talked about how, how the nursing staff deals with it. And uh, yeah, I was really surprised that every time there's a death, they make accommodations. All right. Give some space for that nurse to kind of decompress a little bit after a patient dying. I, don't think that I have the benefit of anything that formal, but, uh, but I do know when I have a difficult death, I look to my partners. I talk to them. We kind of talk about the nuts and bolts of it. And, uh, and I find a lot of comfort there. I think that's one of the benefits of, of having, a you know, colleagues to look to, to turn to because we, we all deal with difficult things and it's nice to have someone to, um, a friend who can look at things objectively and, and give you sound advice. Maybe there is something you could change. And when there is, by all means, do better. But uh, I think everyone appreciates that. None of us are perfect. We all strive to do well. I think everyone that I've worked with in the medical field, honestly, are trying to do the best they can. But I've never met anyone that's perfect. Mm-hmm. So when you do choose to come home and you share you share information with me. And like you said, you're never really forthcoming in information. I suppose that's partly because of HIPAA and partly just out of respect for the patient and their family. But there are times when you tell me, you know, I had a rough day, someone passed away and, and you, I can tell you're just like a little more upset or, or not a hundred percent really like wanting to engage with the family because you're still processing that death or that experience that led up to the death in those situations what kind of advice would you give me or, or any physician spouse? Like what do you think the physician is, is needing most in those moments and how can physician spouses support, support you guys that are, that are dealing with really heavy things? You know, most, most people don't see death as frequently as you do. So how can we help you when you're, maybe not directly asking for it, but you're at least sharing enough that we know that it went down and we'd like to be helpful. Do you have any advice for us? Let me answer that in a roundabout way. All right. (laughs) (laughs) There are 
different groups of people that see and experience things that the rest of the society doesn't really appreciate. Um, one common group is, is those who are in the military. You know, they go and see things that I wish no one in humanity ever had to experience. And when they return home, no civilian can really appreciate the emotional burden that, go, that comes with them. And I think working in the medical field, you get a little bit of that. And so trying to come home and, and explain that to, to your spouse or, or, or loved one, they may not fully appreciate it. And so I think we all kind of hold back a little bit. And so as, as the spouse or significant other of someone in uh, the medical world, I, I think appreciating that, that it's a different realm that they walk in every day and the, the details are, are not going to be fully appreciated. I, I think whatever you do it has to you know, kind of come from that standpoint, that you're not going to fully appreciate it. But at the same time, we all hurt. And just being with each other helps. I remember a chaplain that, uh, that everyone looked up to and I, you know, kind of asked him, like, how do you comfort, you know, the family members of those who are, who are dying? And he said, I'm just with them. I'm just with them. Whatever they're going through that time that I'm spending with them, I sit with them and I try and be with them where they are, be with them where they are emotionally. And you can never fully appreciate what's going on with someone. You know, to fully appreciate it, you have to have all, all of their experiences and, and that track record between, you know, them and their loved ones. You can't have that, but you can do your best to be with them and recognize that, I've hurt too. And I realize that you're hurting right now and I can be with you. I'd say that's the, that's the most any of us can do. Do you feel like when you have those harder days, are you the kind of person, and I'm sure this varies for different people. So are you more the type of person that wants to be left alone and have some space? Or are you more the kind of person that wants to just set down work, so to speak, and then hang out with the kids and your wife and kind of like see the flip side of life, I guess, like life outside the hospital. <laughs> like, can you turn it on and off that fast? Like, <laughs> Hey, you're home. I know someone just died, but I need you to get in the car and take this kid to, you know, wrestling practice. And then we have a band concert at six and I don't know what we're eating for dinner. Like, would you rather jump back into that? Or is it more like, Hey, I'm going to like go decompress for a few hours by myself at the climbing gym. I'll catch up with you about nine o'clock tonight. Like, where do you think you fall or does it, does it depend? What have you seen me do? Uh huh. Well, tell me what you did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that the way the flow of work is in the hospital, it demands us to be able to compartmentalize it. I have walked out of a horrible code where the patient, you know, died despite all of the aggressive efforts and I got to go smile and talk to the next patient and tell them that we're going to do an operation and everything's going to go smoothly and they're going to go home and, and everything's going to be fine. So you get good at compartmentalizing it, but it doesn't mean that you still don't have to deal with it. Yeah. I guess in fairness, when you, when you ask me, you know, what have I seen you do? I, I think I've seen you do both. I think there's been times when I've had no idea what you've gone through at work and we've just like gone through our evening. And then I've been kind of surprised later when you're like, Oh, by the way. And you've shared with me like what you went through. 
maybe it's just a personality difference, but I feel like that'd be like the first thing I told you, you know, whereas you tend to maybe keep it to yourself longer, depending on what's going on with the family that night. But I have seen other times where you're like, Hey, I'm home, but I'm going to be in your office. Keep the door shut. I've got a lot of, you know, like a lot of charts to do. I've got a lot on my mind and nope, I'm not going to be able to go to that tonight. Like you've just told me no sometimes too. So I guess I've seen it both ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it just depends then, right? Like, well, and, and, and I've appreciated that. I know sometimes I come home and I guess it's always you have to, you know, read your partner and assess. And, and if you and the kids are playing and having a good time, I'm probably more apt to, you know, kind of focus on what's going on. And if the kids are going crazy and the toilets overflowed and, you know, <laughs> there, there's, there's chaos at home. I'm more likely to, you know, kind of jump in the fray and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then deal with what I need to deal with after yeah. things are in a better place. And likewise on my end, like if things are going pretty well, I'm like, sure, go take some time for yourself. Go to the climbing gym, go like get all your notes done at your office at work or whatever. And if things are chaotic, I'm like, yep, you better compartmentalize that because it's time to be home, you know? <laughs> so I guess it just goes both ways. Well, as with any marriage, you just, it's teamwork. Yeah. You just go with it. Well, thanks for being on my show. Thanks for um, answering these questions. I know they weren't easy. Do you have any other advice or anything you'd like to say before we close this out? One thing that I learned in my fellowship that I think has helped me and helped a lot of people that I work with was this concept of a pause. Whenever someone is is actively trying to die in a hospital, you know, it's it's all hands on deck. And so a lot of people show up, a lot of effort takes place, and uh it's it's physically and emotionally and intellectually draining sometimes as you're actually trying to to keep someone from from dying. And with a pause, after you've determined that you know, we're, we're unsuccessful and that, that we're going to stop our efforts to resuscitate this patient. You ask everyone to pause. You ask everyone to have a moment of silence and you thank them for their efforts. And you ask them to uh, remember that this was a life, that this was someone's loved one and that he was important or she was important to someone. And it's profoundly silent. And if you look around the room, you see uh, everyone pause and give that respect. You see um, sometimes pain in other people's faces as, you know, who knows what they're dealing with. Maybe they just had a loved one pass away themselves. People deal with um, the loss of a patient in a variety of ways. But uh, people have come up to me and said, you know, thank you for, for giving us that pause it helped. And so I think no matter what we're going through, remembering that it's our humanity that, that, that brings us together. It's our humanity that inspires us to, to work in healthcare, to, to bless the lives of others and make them better, to restore them to health as best we can. And if we remember that and keep that as our foundation, even when they pass away, I think it helps us to heal and give better care to the next person we have to go see. I love that advice. I remember you learning it in fellowship and how much you liked it and how you've kept it as part of your practice. How long do you think those pauses last? They're brief. Mm -hmm. They're brief. You don't want to drag them out uncomfortably, mm -hmm. but you let moments pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're all busy, but it doesn't take long to, to still have the effect that you need. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great practice. Thank you for sharing that with us, Josh. And thanks for, well, just being you and for coming on the show again. You are welcome. And I hope to uh, come on your show anytime you ask. <laughs> um, I have enjoyed your podcast and I am forever your biggest fan. <laughs> thanks, sweetie. Bye everyone. See you next week. 
Hey everyone, did you know that I'm now offering life coaching? What, what? I am, and it is so fun. I have really enjoyed visiting with some of my listeners one-on-one and helping them through their relationships. And you know the biggest relationship that most of us need to work on? That's right. It's our relationship with ourselves, And I really specialize in that. And I hope that you will let me help you in that way. My mission here has always been to make successful homes happier. And I believe that one way I can do that is through coaching you. So give me an email or send me a message on Facebook or Instagram. I'm Laura at MarriedToDoctors.com. L-A-R-A at MarriedToDoctors.com. Can't wait to connect. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Married to Doctors podcast. Our mission is to make successful homes happier. To learn more or to share your story, visit our website at MarriedToDoctors.com.